Hey, it's Jen. Have you ever listened to one of the episodes and thought to yourself, oh, I wish I could leave a response to that, or I wish I could leave feedback or ask a question? Did you know there's actually a way to do that in Spotify now? I know, it's super cool. So if you head over to Spotify and search for Java with Jen podcast or Java with Jen hearing God's voice for everyday life, you may have to search all of it. And then you go and check out my most recent episodes. There are polls and Q&A options that you can weigh in on and I can connect with you that way over here on this platform. I usually use Instagram to connect with you guys, but now with this feature from Spotify, it's a super cool way to engage with the content of each episode and talk to me directly. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. So go head over to my latest episodes on Spotify and let's do that right now. Hey friend. Have you ever felt like you're standing in front of an elevator, waiting for the doors to open and it's your life and you're waiting for your next season to begin. You're waiting for that promotion that God put in your heart that you feel is just within reach, but it's like you're just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and you feel like somehow the whole situation is waiting on you and you're not sure what you're supposed to do about it. Or perhaps the door opens And you go to get in and the door closes before you can actually step through that new opportunity. I've experienced this so many times. And this week I had an experience where I feel like the Lord showed me the why behind that. And I feel like this is a word for y'all. I shared it with a friend briefly and she said, please make that a podcast episode. So that's what I'm doing. I'm making this an episode because I really feel like the principles that the Lord showed me through my own personal failure this week... um, has the power to really offer you some tools to kick into motion, possibly that next season that the Lord has for you, so you can step into the promotion that God has in store for your life. So stay tuned. Let's cue that intro music. Hi, and you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenna Lee Samuel. Okay, so thanks so much for joining for today's episode, you guys. I really am excited. Sometimes I, you know, pull together a message. It's just something on my heart. And sometimes I pull together a message for an episode and it feels like a word for y'all. And this one feels like a word for y'all. It was equally a word for me and it really shifted some things in my heart and some things in my life. And so I'm pretty excited. Also, don't miss life hacks because at the very end in the life hacks segment, I am going to be sharing three fashion tips for the fall. And if you guys don't follow my stylist, my styling account on Instagram, um, some of y'all don't know I'm a wardrobe stylist. I worked for Stitch Fix for three years. I've styled over 8,000 people. I am in fashion and I love it. Um, I have my own business where I style people locally. And so anyways, I love to drop fashion tips. Um, Sometimes I don't do it a lot on the podcast, but if you follow me on Instagram at at my handle is J Samuel Styling, just the letter J for Jenna Lee. J Samuels, my last name, Styling, no spaces. I think I have it in my bio actually. Um, for if you follow me at Java with Jen on Instagram, I have it in my bio, so you can just click that. So, anyways, uh, stay tuned for life hacks. It's gonna be some fun fashion tips because fall is my favorite season for picking out clothes. Okay, so on to today's episode. So I already talked about briefly in the intro about how sometimes we can be in a life moment where we feel like transition is at hand and transition is close by but but for some reason it just feels like it's delaying and it's just it's just it's like we're just on pause and it's like what gives what is going to open this door or an opportunity presents itself and then before you can actually fulfill that opportunity the door shuts on you and i don't know about y'all but this has happened to me so many flipping times and it frustrates me and i've prayed so many times like god what is behind this so let me share with you what was my personal failure this week <laughs> that taught me this so i we had the hurricane here recently and um i worked for a company that uh i was technically a contract worker i just brought my skills to the table and um was able to just benefit the company with my skills and 
However, they had always kind of treated me like an employee versus contract. And um, so when we evacuated for the hurricane in the past, what I've done since my role was kind of public, I just, instead of being fulfilling the public side of my role, I would just kind of do a lot of behind the scenes stuff and I'd still get paid and whatever. It was all great. Well, this time, um, suddenly without notice, I was, they were like, hey, don't, don't work at all and you're not going to get a paycheck either so I was like what and so I felt kind of frustrated over that especially you know with us evacuated we had some new some fresh expenses with that unexpected expenses and then we got back in town and uh they called me and just over the phone uh we're like hey we're reevaluating our company we're downsizing whatever whatever we don't need your services anymore so I lost my job no notice nothing they just kind of it was just very abrupt and it felt it felt um it just felt abrupt and now I had been praying for an opportunity to to leave but I didn't want to leave them hanging without someone to fulfill my position and I hadn't found someone so the Lord did present an out for me but just the way it happened was very uncomfortable um and so my response though to both of those at first I was going to get all upset and like ah freaked out about it but then I was like you know what Lord I'm not going to waste my energy fighting this. You can take care of me and provide my paycheck. You can take care of me and provide a job. Like I'm just not going to, I'm not going to wig out about it. And so sure enough, um, the same week, the, the week after I lost my paycheck, uh, a client had contacted me through Instagram, a new client, and hired me to do personal shopping. So I spent time with her and it replaced some of my income. So I was like, look at the Lord, like he totally knew. And the day before I lost my job, I had gone into Target and was styling mannequins and whatever, and they offered me a job. And I was like, what? I don't, I don't, I have a job. I don't really need a job. Well, then the next day I lost my job. So I was like, wow, that was the Lord totally setting me up. And then when I just decided not to have a bad attitude about things, um, I also had an opportunity come up at church. And, you know, not, not like some huge opportunities just to sing with the worship team, but I'm, you know, new there. And so it was still an honor. And so I was like, wow, that's so awesome. So I'm appreciating all these open doors and all this favor, clearly the Lord's favor as he's providing for me and showing me he's got my back, you know? Well, then that evening I uh, was calling my sister and I had had some time to think about how I'd been fired and um, how things had, had gone. And I just got all stuck up not stuck up. I got all, I got all hung up in my heart on how I was handled. And, and I got all hung up on, I should have been treated better than that. That wasn't professional. It should have been this. It should have been that. It should have been whatever, you know? And, and for all I know, I don't know the whole story. For all I know, they may have kept me on much longer than they could have. You know what I mean? Like maybe they needed to let me go months ago and they just held on to me to be gracious, you know? So I didn't know the whole story. But in my heart, I got into some complaining. So I I called my sister and I was venting, as we like to call our complaining episodes, venting, right? Uh, I was venting to my sister, but I really kind of got stuck on that loop of, man, this wasn't right. And they didn't handle me right. And they did it wrong. And they should have done it different. And I should have been treated better than that because this, that, and the other reason why I am so valuable. And, you know, like I, I really just got stuck on myself. And while I was complaining... Um, I got an email that the application I did end up putting into Target was declined and that the situ- the position to help seeing on the worship team that Sunday, suddenly they didn't need me because they had somebody. So like two of those open doors got shut on my face while I'm having this complain o session. <laughs> so that night I was talking to the boys at, as I was tucking them into bed and we were talking about pride and humility and we got on that subject through something that came up during the day, I don't remember. And and the Lord started putting the pieces together in my head as I was talking to them. And I was talking about how that scripture where it says the Lord um, is opposed, or God, is, God uh, resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I was explaining to my boys how grace is where there's favor and there's opportunity and there's um good relationships and all this stuff. And then, but resistance is where it's like a stiff arm where you can't move forward even if you want to. And it's a closed door in your face. And it's just, there's, there's no opportunity and no favor. And I was thinking about what I had just experienced that day with the job and the closed doors and whatever. And I was like, holy crap, 
I was like, I was walking in pride. And that's how these doors got closed on my face. And it's crazy because I didn't think of, I didn't think of venting to my sister on the phone as anything wrong. You know, we all have those people close to us where we kind of just let our hair down and say the things, you know. And, and I'm not saying that venting and processing is wrong at all. But what happened in my heart in that time that made it wrong is it shifted me from a God-focused response, I'm just going to trust you, Lord, I'm going to let you handle this, to a me-focused response. I deserve better than that. I should have been treated better than that. I this and I that. And so the Lord began to take me on this little discovery of the difference between pride and humility because I realized, I think I, whenever we think of pride and humility, at least I frequently think of it as how we view ourselves. You know, am I overestimating myself? Am I underestimating others so that I can be better? I think of that as pride and humility as having a more just lowly perspective of myself. But the Lord began to show me how pride and humility is really less, not, not, not that it's not about that, but even deeper or more foundational than that is that pride is a focus on me and humility is a focus on God. And it's that simple. And when we, when we inflate our perceptions of ourselves, that's because we have deflated our perception of God. Because when we look at the fullness of who God is, his bigness is going to cause us to have a, a, a really great shrinking experience <laughs> where I realize I'm so small in, in the presence of this big, mighty God. So I have, I've literally given you the whole principle already, but I want to dig into pride and humility because as I started to study it out, the Lord really began to unfold for me some, some really valuable things. So... I want to tie for us like complaining. When we go through a hard situation, a lot of times we're given to complaining. And I, I want you to see how complaining is tied to pride. And so that's what I'm going to start digging into is complaining right here. Now, I heard John Bevere um, talking about how when him and Lisa were younger and the kids were younger, they would discipline complaining because complaining is rebellion. And re what what complaining says is, I don't like what's happening here. I have a better way of doing it. It should be done my way. And so I'm going to gripe and fuss until things change and go my way. Well, if our kids do that, we understand that's a type of rebellion. If I say, no, I need you to go to bed now. And all they do is proceed to complain and complain and, and whine and whatever. That's not obedience, right? That's not trusting my decision as their parent. That is them um, exalting their way of doing things or their preference for how things should be done over my decision. It's, it's rebellion. And so complaining causes us to get out of a reliance and a trust in God's wisdom. And it, it takes us out of surrender and it puts us into a posture of pride. Okay? Okay. Now, now there is a, I don't want you guys to feel like you can't talk to your friend honestly or that you can't process difficult situations. That's not what I'm saying at all. Processing, and I'm going to help make that differentiation right now. Processing and venting where it's, it's, it's healthy and helpful and necessary because you do. You got to talk stuff through sometimes. I definitely <laughs> have to talk things through. And I'm so grateful for my sisters and my husband for that. But processing is when you process a difficult situation, it's an acknowledgement of the situation. Say what happened. Describe the whole scenario. You can explain the circumstances. Explain your feelings. Process it all out. But processing, healthy processing, leaves you in the place um, where it maintains a focus on what you can do to bring a resolution to the situation. It, it maintains a healthy um, you retain some sense of control in this situation, a healthy control where you have self-control and it's like, you know what? I can't change what happened to me, but 
let me process through how maybe I can respond to this situation. So venting or processing is healthy and important, whether that's journaling, whether that's talking to a friend, whether that's in prayer, but analyzing and evaluating the situation and talking it all out is good and healthy if the focus is on how you can have a hand in bringing resolution to the situation. And sometimes that does look like I'm just going to take my hands off and trust the Lord. Sometimes that's what it looks like. Um, So it's a little bit more of a broad perspective. You'll also, if you're processing healthfully, you'll also be able to look at the situation and consider other perspectives, not just yours. But you can consider like when I looked back on the situation from a more healthy standpoint, I was able to say, you know what? I don't know uh, the whole situation. Maybe my bosses had kept me on for months longer than they really could or maybe they wanted to let me go a while back but they didn't want to hurt me or disappoint me you know what I mean like being able to give the benefit of the doubt to the situation or to the people involved allows you to vent and process from a healthy place complaining is more of a passive victimized posture it's it's a griping it says It's more blaming. It's like you're pointing the finger at what happened and what was wrong and judging all the people and all the decisions in the process and labeling them all as wrong and you as right. (laughs) And so it's much more of a narrow focus. It's a narrow perspective. When you're complaining, um, you, you are not seeing it from anyone else's perspective but your own. And what happens is when we complain and and respond more like a victim, we are not taking a posture of trust in the Lord. We're taking a posture of pride again because it says, I'm right and y'all are wrong. My way is the best way. Y'all's is not working. You know what I mean? So it's, again, it's, it's it's a prideful posture that is not healthy and it does not focus on bringing a resolution. It focuses on, There's no resolution unless y'all change what you did. And you guys all know that's not really a resolution because we can't control what other people have done or will do, right? So that's the difference between healthy processing and complaining. Healthy processing focuses on what you can do to bring resolution and how you can maintain a place of self-empowerment. And complaining is me focused because it's me saying all y'all are wrong or me saying all these situations were wrong. I was mistreated. I'm the only right one in this situation and this situation won't be rectified unless we do it my way. That is complaining and that is from a prideful foundation. Complaining, here's another aspect of complaining. Um, that I see in scripture is that complaining fills my heart with resentment and a root of bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15. Uh, let me look this up because I want to read it correctly. Hebrews 12, 15 talks about a root of bitterness and how it defiles us. And it's crazy how kind of like we're about the Bible says a little bit of yeast leavens the whole batch. Sometimes a little bit of Actually, most times, a little bit of bitterness, a little bit of resentment will work its way through your entire being, through your entire perspective of life. It's kind of scary. And so that's where Hebrews 12, 15 says, um, look after each other. In other words, we're supposed to get each other's backs as believers. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. And I thought it was interesting that it says in this other translation, it says, see to it that none of you fall short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness can grow up to cause trouble and defile many. How many of you guys have seen when you grow embittered about a situation, it kind of has this snowball effect where over time, you find that a lot of your relationships begin to become troubled and maybe you're griping at people more. Maybe you're unhappy in your relationships more. Maybe maybe, um, it feels like you just can't quite get settled in any situation because there's just a discontentment inside of you, right? 
it causes trouble. And that's because bitterness in our heart creates a lens that we look through life at that is cynical and critical. And when we're cynical and critical, I mean, the Bible also says in Proverbs that pride only breeds quarrels. When we allow a root of bitterness or a belief that I'm right and everyone else is wrong, or I was right, I was mistreated, I'm going to have to get my own back. um, All of that is rooted in pride because it's all me focused. Pride causes quarrels. And when we have a me-centered perspective of life, it causes us to have unrest In our relationships with your boss, with your spouse, with your kids, with your friendships, it'll it'll feel like you can't get settled anywhere that you are. And it's because a root of bitterness causes trouble and it defiles many. It's defiling you. It's defiling me. When I've let bitterness and resentment grow in my heart, it's subtle. It's easy to not recognize. It really, really is. But if you get quiet and still and really pay attention Like I find that when I have bitterness and pride in my heart, it's hard to hear God's voice too. It's hard to connect with him intimately in my quiet time because he's opposed to the proud, right? He he can't draw near to pride in a lifted up soul because that is in the way. I'm not making room for God when I'm solely focused on myself, my troubles, my inconveniences, my whatever. And listen, I'm saying... I'm saying this from having walked through 14 years of, a, of an abusive personal relationship and five years of, a, of abusive is a strong word, but a really unhealthy, toxic relationship with a pastor in my past. And I saw that was really my, my process of wrestling through and figuring out how to balance not letting bitterness creep up not letting myself fall into complaining and and grumbling, um, but healthfully trying to figure out how to resolve the situation. And let me just tell you, I failed a lot. <laughs> I feel like a lot of unforgiveness grew in my heart. I feel like a lot of bitterness grew in my heart and a lot of resentment. And 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 I watched slowly as my nature changed into someone that I wasn't I didn't like. I watched my other relationships become filled with insecurity and filled with strife and uncertainty where I always had, before then I'd always had all kinds of peace in my relationships and confidence in my relationships and I I never really wrestled with insecurity and all this stuff. But when I allowed bitterness and unforgiveness to grow in my heart, it literally defiled all these areas of my life. And so... I'm not, I'm not, I just want you to know, I'm not, I'm not sharing this principle from a place of having always lived in comfortable situations. Like I've had to go through how to know where those lines are. What is healthy processing? What is unhealthy um, bitterness and resentment and complaining? You know what I mean? Um, Proverbs 18, 20 also says from the fruit of your mouth, your belly is filled and with the harvest of your lips, you are satisfied. And that sounds positive and wonderful, but I've thought about it before. Like, what does that mean? Like, my belly is filled by the fruit of my mouth? Like, what? What does that mean? And, I, and when I made that phone call to my sister to process my lost job, I realized my heart had been in a good place. I had laid it down and trusted the Lord with it. But when I started talking about all the injustices and all the ways that I felt that I had been mistreated... It started to fill my inner parts, my heart, or like my belly, my inner man, with bitterness and discontentment and a sense of resentment. And I realized that the things that come out of my mouth fill my inner man. Did you know that actually your brain registers what comes out of your mouth like as four times more accurate? I'm probably making that number up, but it weighs it. Maybe it's 80% more true or something like that. Your brain registers what comes out of your mouth as a lot more factual than just what you think. And so you have to be careful what you say because your brain registers it differently than just what's playing around inside of your head. And so when your brain registers it as true, your whole being then begins to cooperate with whatever words you just spoke. So if I'm speaking like I'm being mistreated and I'm being treated like this and da 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 da, 
all of my faculties begin to cooperate with that resentment and with that bitterness. And so my whole being begins to be postured incorrectly. So does, does that make sense? And so when we position ourselves ever in life as an underdog or as a victim, and this is how this complaining also ties to pride. When we position ourselves as that, we're not actually positioning ourselves in truth because the Bible says in Romans 8, 37, that you are more than a conqueror in Christ. And it says in Deuteronomy 20, 18, that the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, if you obey my commands and follow them. And so when we're submitted to truth, then we're walking in humility because, of course, truth keeps the focus on God and what he's doing. But when I am focused on what is going on around me and the injustices there, I begin to position myself as a victim. And that victimized mentality removes me from the truth of the word of God because God never once calls me a victim in scripture. Even when a situation happens where I have been treated like a victim or I have been very mistreated. Think about Joseph in the Bible when he was wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife and he was thrown in jail. God never responded to him like he was a victim, ever. I mean, there's so many instances in scripture where men and women of God are treated wrong. But we see how when they finally surrender those situations to God, God is able to use those situations to position them for the upgrade and for the promotion that he has for them. And so that's another reason why it's important not to complain when we go through difficult moments because what looks and feels uncomfortable may actually be the process necessary to get me to my next stage. Does that make sense? In fact, the Lord kind of gave me this analogy when I was fussing, when I was fussing over that whole situation. The Lord showed me a picture of like a wounded soldier and he was wounded in battle and he was desperate for a rescue. And the Lord showed me, you know, you've seen it in movies where they have to like run through the woods and they're they're injured but they're just trying to make it to the open field where the helicopter is gonna land and and they're constantly on the lookout and they get bit by a snake and they they have to duck and hide in the mud and then they have to you know and they barely make it like they barely make it alive but there's so much relief when they finally get rescued and god god showed me this picture and he said you know jen that soldier is not going to waste his energy complaining about the snake and the mud and the struggle that it was to get out of there, he's going to be so grateful that he got rescued and his life was saved. And I feel like the Lord was kind of like telling me to man up a little bit. And he was like, Jen, just because I have something for you does not mean it's going to be peaches and cream. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's not me. And I was like, oh, dang, <laughs> you're right. Because I realized I had been praying for an opportunity to leave that job, not because I didn't love it, but just because I felt my life shifting into my next season. But I, I wasn't going to leave without a replacement. Only the Lord knew the position of the company and you know how they were going to need to downsize. So the Lord wasn't going to give me someone to take my position because <laughs> there wasn't going to be a position to take, you know, and I didn't know that. And so I would have stayed there forever until the Lord created an exit for me. And so the Lord created an exit. And he was like, I made the exit for you. I legitimately answered your prayer. And you're spending all your energy complaining about the way it happened. Like, get over yourself. <laughs> and so I just, you know, I did. When the Lord showed me all this, I just really had to repent. I was like, good Lord. I really did get all hung up on myself, didn't I? And I just saw how, you know, the enemy did. He drew my thoughts into a me focused position. And I'm really thankful, honestly, for that, that day where all those doors came open and then all those do doors shut. Cause I felt like the Lord clued me into a dynamic that has possibly been alive in my life for years. And I never saw the connection. And that's what made me think of you guys. Like how, how many other people, because especially in our culture, complaining is, is a normal, like respected almost um, practice, you know, people, 
we, we make excuse for, oh, they're just venting. Oh, they just need to get it off their chest. You know, we go to a friend and we talk about this other person who wronged us and we're like, ah, blah, 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 blah. and that friend feels like we've just trusted them with precious, um, you know, precious information of our soul, you know, so they don't confront us and tell us, Hey, you need to go talk to that person. <laughs> you know, like, like we they're in our culture. We, we just have somehow gotten away from the need to just man up and realize hardship will come. It's not always going to be good vibes only. You know what I mean? It's not always good vibes. Sometimes it's really hard vibes. And you know, that doesn't mean it's not God because let me go through this. Uh, before I get onto that, Romans eight twenty eight said, God works all things for our good. Listen, that's all things for our good, for those who've been called according to his purposes, for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purposes, Romans eight twenty eight. <clears throat> if God works all things for my good, then it doesn't matter how ugly the situation, God can work it for my good. And if God can work any stinking thing that comes my way for my good, then I literally never have an excuse to complain, ever. Because I know that though it might be uncomfortable for a moment, he's going to turn it around and work it for my good. Somehow I was, able, I was able to embrace that when we flooded and I lost my home. I was able to stay focused on the fact that God was going to give us a better home after the fact. And I think he just gave me grace. But it's like we forget that. We forget that God has a plan to turn things around for our good if we will only let go of it and trust him. But I feel like many times when things don't work out for our good, it's because we never actually let go of it. We never actually chose to trust him with it. We hung on to it. Or maybe we trusted him for a period of time. And when our faith ran out, we felt like, God, you never showed up. I'm going to take this thing back. I'm going to pick this thing back up. I did that. I did that in that 14-year relationship, in that five-year uh, pastoral relationship. I, I gave up. I felt like 14 years, God, really? How long, how long do I need to believe you to, to step into that relationship? How long? Where did you go? You, were, you never showed up. You failed me. And, and I look back and I see how the Lord did finally step in. But I realize he really was testing the limits of my faith. 14 years is a long time to trust the Lord and believe him for a relationship. And I did run out of faith. Totally did. And when, about when I ran out of faith, shortly after is when he stepped in. And so he never proved unfaithful. He was stretching my capacity to believe him for his promises, as well as there was things I could have done differently as well. I, I learned that in retrospect. And so, um, but there are a lot of times what we'll do is we'll end up believing that God somehow didn't come through, that somehow God didn't show up. And what he's doing in those moments, he's not failing us. He's actually expanding us. He's, he's growing us. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials and temptations of many kinds, because we know that the hardship of these moments produces perseverance. And perseverance produces in you maturity so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I said it I said it mostly right, but somewhat wrong, and that bothers me. I don't like to say the Bible wrong, so let me let me read it correctly. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? Because we know he works all things for our good, right? For you know that when your faith is tested... Your endurance has a chance to grow. That is what was happening to me in that 14-year relationship. My faith was tested. I got to the point where I said, God, where are you? You haven't shown up. I can't do this anymore. What he was doing is he was causing my endurance to grow. Because now what? Shortly after I ran out of faith and hope, God stepped in. And you know what that did? to like working out your muscles. I reached my quitting point and I can look back now and go, you know what? He came. He did come and so he showed up and so do I want to have to endure 14 years of a difficult relationship again? No, but I do, I can look at that and say, you know what? He didn't give up on me even after 14 years. He got involved and I also learned from what I could have done differently to maybe have shortened that process, you know, because I am a part of that process as well. Um, okay, so your faith is tested. Your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, 
you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And so the whole point of these challenging situations in us, the word also talks about how the, when the word is planted in our hearts, it will be tested. And so whenever you feel like you're going through fire, whenever you feel like you're going through a difficult situation, program yourself instead of complaining about it. If you complain, you will not experience the grown faith. You will not experience the growth in your endurance. If you're complaining, your eyes are no longer on God. Your eyes are on you and it's become a pity party and it's not going to help you. It's going to fill you with a root of bitterness and that in itself is pride and God cannot promote pride. God is opposed to the proud, right? So we're shutting doors on ourselves by going down that path of complaining and um, griping and criticizing and accusing. That is the path where you will not, you're, you're really just stopped. You just run into a dead end when we go that direction. But when our faith is tested as it will be, it will be tested. It, it will be. But consider it like what I've come to do is, is when I'm in a difficult situation that's very uncomfortable or it's challenging or, or stirring up stuff inside of me. I feel pressed. I've, I've programmed myself to say, okay, Lord, I see the test. What am I to be learning in this? Show me what I'm to be learning in this because I want to learn it so I don't have to live here any longer than necessary. <laughs> How can I cooperate? with what you're trying to teach me right now so that I don't have to be here any longer than necessary. And I feel like the one thing, the first place we need to go when we're in those moments is to humility. Humility is to shift my eyes off of myself, off of my situation, and shift my eyes to the Father so that my focus is Him, trusting Him, refusing to spend all my energy fighting him, but realize, you know what? These trials come for my good. What It's kind of like when I was having my babies and they were like, listen, don't fight the contractions. The contractions are actually helping you get to the delivery. The contractions are the muscles pulling your body open to push the kid out. So if you fight against those contractions, you actually make your labor longer. That's what we do in life. We feel those contractions of of God refining our character and we tend to fight against it. But if instead of fighting against it, you will take your hands off and breathe into it, relax into it. That's what you have to do in labor, right? You relax into it and remind yourself, this contraction is for my good. This contraction is for my good. (laughs) It will bring the baby. It will bring the life. It is such an illustration of what God is doing. This difficult situation is for my good. This difficult situation will bring the baby. It will bring the life. Like it will bring the maturity. So I'm perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God is preparing you for your next season whenever you're going through a hard moment. When you're tested in the way that you respond to authority, when you're tested in the way you respond to financial need, when you're tested in the way that you respond to um, betrayal or your, your name being accused or all of those things. Those are all common things that I see happening before promotion. God is testing you and he's maturing you to make you ready for what is next. So just remember pride partners with complaining and grumbling about each other. Complaining comes out of pride because it's a distrust of God. So when Let's see, James 5, 9 says, Do not grumble against each other so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge himself is standing at the door. Isn't it interesting? It ties grumbling and complaining with a door, a doorway. James 5, 9. When I'm grumbling and complaining, when I got into grumbling and complaining, those two doors closed on me. What are you grumbling and complaining about? that might actually be right on the other side of that situation, a door that God has for you. Or what door have you been waiting to open, but because you've been grumbling and complaining, that door has remained closed. Quite likely, God wants to open it to you, but he's waiting for the maturing to be completed so that you are lacking nothing for your next season. So the solution, here's the remedy. 
we need to throw ourselves into humility. There's a passage in the Old Testament, I believe it's Ecclesiastes, that says that you need not say anything. The Lord your God will defend you. And that scripture came up at a time when my husband and I uh, had found out that somebody at our church was spreading rumors about us that were untrue. And if I had let myself get really upset about it, I could have gotten really upset about it. It was definitely a shock because they were actually accusing us of something that they were guilty of, which was just ironic. Um, but it was, it was something that we really prayed about. Like it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty heavy accusation. And we found out through friends what was being said about us. And, um, so we prayed about it. We were like, God, what do we, what do we do? And it was a trial. It was my name was being accused. My, my integrity was being accused. And, um, and it was a trial. And I was like, what do we do? And that scripture kept coming up of, you need not defend yourself. You need not say anything. The Lord, your God will be your defender. And so we just took our hands off of it and said, you know what, Lord, we're going to let you be our defender. We're going to let you speak to that situation. And it actually freed me from the grief and the worry and the anxiety of the situation. And that is the posture of humility is, God, I'm going to allow you to defend me. Now, let me make exception. There are exceptions to these rules. Not that we ever abandon trusting the Lord, but... I referenced when in that 14-year abusive relationship um, that I felt like God never showed up. I felt like God never rescued me. And in looking back, I saw that I could have done something different. When you're in, in in a situation that's wrong like that, and you're believing God to step in and shift some things, remember this. Faith without works is dead. I was believing God to step in, but I was believing in a very passive way. I thought the only correct godly response was to keep my hands off. Don't touch it. Just pray. And there's a time and a place for that. Absolutely. Like this situation where we were being accused and God said, keep your hands off. Just let me defend you. You know, so that was the proper response for that situation. For this other situation, that 14 years, I look back and I realized God needed me to partner with him. He was trying to do a work in that relationship. And had I, when I did start speaking up and creating some boundaries in that relationship, it forced the other person to confront their own broken places that was hurting our relationship. So I didn't realize till years of enduring that, that God needed me to partner with him. And and by, by, you know, not complaining, not griping, not being vengeful, but just speaking up and saying, you know what, that is not acceptable behavior if you want this relationship. And that's not how you're going to treat me. And that's not how I'm going to tolerate being treated. Not in an arrogant way, not in a victimized way, but in a, I know I have value. And, um, I trust the Lord to protect me, but I'm also going to establish some boundaries with you. There's, it's like, a, it's like, there's a fine line between an arrogant sense of personal value and a humble sense of personal value. Humility acknowledges the truth that I'm valuable. In fact, the word says that we're to love others as we love ourselves. You have to have some value for yourself if you're going to even walk in love towards others, Right. There's nothing wrong with having boundaries. Jesus and God both have boundaries. Holy Spirit has boundaries. Like the word says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Talks about gossip and stuff. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And then with Jesus and with actually with God in the Ten Commandments, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament says, if you love the Lord God like this, these will be the blessings that come of your relationship. If you don't, these will be the not blessings <laughs> that come. And so like even God and Jesus have expectations and boundaries on the relationship. God says, I oppose the proud, but I give grace to the humble. God draws near to relationships that are full of humility. That is a boundary for him. He will not draw near to pride. 
That's a boundary for him. You are allowed to have boundaries in your relationships and in situations that come. They may forge your character because it's still a trial. Even if you are able to retain um, some power in the situation to be able to shift things or determine if you will or will not remain in that situation, having a, having a place of power doesn't mean that you're not still being shaped by that situation. You know what I mean? I hope I, I hope I made that clear. I just don't ever want people to think that trusting God is equated to passively living. And sometimes in Christian circles, I think we can do that. And I experienced the hardship of, of that. I didn't want to get away from trusting God, but I didn't recognize that in trusting God, I needed to partner with his work in the relationship by speaking up and having some boundaries also. And so... Anyways, moving into humility. So humility is best described. Have I lost you guys? I hope I haven't. I hope you guys are still listening. This one's a little more teaching oriented, but it was just so rich. I really hope this is this is building you up. Um, in Philippians, listen to this, you guys. This is so rich. Philippians 2. It says, let's see. It's talking about humility. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. So that's one principle that points to what humility looks like. It's where we can say, you know what? You're better than me. You're valuable. That doesn't mean I'm not valuable at all. It just means I treat you with the honor of being of utmost value, right? Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. That's verse four. In other words, don't be selfishly motivated. Look out for others. Be Operate out of love. Um, It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ had, which was that even though he was God, I mean, think about if someone had a reason to have a really lofty perspective of themselves, it was Jesus. (laughs) He was God. Hello. (laughs) You know, it said he did not think of himself. um, He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He gave up his, his sense of bigness. Instead, it says in verse 7, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, right? Again, humility is connected to obeying God's hand, obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on a cross. Listen, God's plan for Jesus was to die a brutal death. He humbled himself and then he died. (laughs) That is the most uncomfortable situation anyone could ask for. And Jesus embraced it and Jesus did not complain about it because he didn't believe that God's path is always the comfortable path. He knew that God's path, though it might be uncomfortable and cause my flesh to have to die, Ultimately, it brings life. And it's hard for us to see that in the short term a lot of times. That's why trust in God is so important. And it says, therefore, because he did this, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Christ Jesus is Lord. So Jesus humbled himself did not cling to lofty titles, did not cling to, I am God and I'm going to try to prove that to you guys. He let go of that. He was like, I'm not going to try to prove nothing. I'm going to lower myself to this low position of a human and I'm going to lay down my life and it's going to cause suffering and it's going to hurt. But as the result of his humility and him submitting himself to God's plan. Now, now listen though, There was many times in Jesus' life that people came after him to try to harm him. And it says that the Holy Spirit told Jesus what they were plotting and Jesus left. So listen, if you're in an abusive situation, there is a time to leave. There is a time to get out of that situation. Having boundaries and knowing what is God's plan for you and what is not God's plan for you. What is part of what you need to endure and what is something that you need to draw a line and get away from, both are necessary. And Jesus demonstrated both. And, and what's at the bottom of that is, is not this passive, 
oh, okay, sera, okay, sera. I'll take whatever comes because God must be working something. No, you have to be discerning. You need to know what God's perfect plan and will for you is, you know. Now, when we keep our hearts set on him and we keep a heart that trusts him, then we'll know in our heart, like when the Lord is like, hey, get out of this situation. It's not a good situation for you. But we'll also know when just, even though a situation is hard, there's grace for it. And we know that we just have to let ourselves be forged by it. So there's going to be a discernment there that you have to exercise. <clears throat> right after all of this, it says, um, let's see. It's so funny. In the passage, right after the humility section, it says in verse 14, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live a clean, innocent life as a child of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. How crazy it is that he partners complaining and arguing with what will set, like not complaining and arguing with what will set us apart in front of our generation. What will cause us to shine brightly? And listen, if you're going to shine brightly in your generation, God's going to promote you. God's going to put you in a place where you're visible because he, what? he wants the light up on the hill because when the light is shining brightly, it draws people to it. When we are shining brightly for the Lord, it draws people to us so that we can then lead them to him, right? God doesn't cause us to shine brightly to lead people to us. He causes us to shine brightly to lead us, lead people to him. That's why trusting God and always putting our confidence in God and keeping our eyes on God is so important because we have to stay focused on him so that when people are drawn to us, we point them to him and not to us, right? Okay. So consider this. Let me share with you the end of my story. Those two doors were closed to me. The, uh, the application at Target and the opportunity at church. When the Lord showed me the connection between pride and humility and how I lifted myself up in complaining and all that kind of stuff, I spent some time studying out pride and humility because I wanted to really establish in my heart what he was showing me. And then I spent some time repenting. And I said, you know, Lord, I'm so sorry. Like, how many times have I done this and I never even realized that's what I was doing? And so I just spent time repenting and telling him I'm sorry. Like, I do not want a heart of complaining. I don't want to be resistant to your hand in my life. I don't want to shift the focus to me when the, sh when the focus needs to be you. I don't want any of that. So forgive me for doing that. And I just, I just lay these situations before you. I know you'll take care of me. I know you'll have a job for me. I know you'll promote me as necessary, but help me to continue to walk in humility. And do you know that next day, I had gone into Target and spoke with the manager and he didn't know my application had been rejected. And he was like, oh, no, 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 we need you. No, 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 I'm going to fix that. And so he still wanted to hire me. And a couple days after that, I got a text message inviting me to come be on the worship team again. <laughs> and so it was like those two doors that had been open, got closed because of my complaining. And then after my repentance got opened up to me again, it was, just, <laughs> it was like the Lord was like, here, let me make it really plain for you. Let me show you the connection here. Okay. So as you're evaluating, cause I know this is going to stir up thoughts and, and, and situations in your own life. As you're evaluating pride versus humility, just remember pride is not just about how we esteem ourselves and others it's all it's it's really more foundationally about how we esteem god now something that the lord showed me in this process that i want you to keep in mind when we shift the focus to ourselves and and off of god it's really because there's a trust issue there i'm not trusting the lord now obviously we know that in theory of course you're not trusting the lord you just need to trust god more well at some point our trust in him just like our faith in him, it hits a wall and we, we are confronted with, why am I not trusting God in this situation? Why do I feel like I need to take it in my own hands? And so I had to ask myself that. I said, God, why was I not trusting? Why did I get into complaining? Why did I feel like I needed to handle the situation myself? And I realized that there was still remnants of, of broken trust in my heart from that 14-year relationship and five-year relationship that I had taken on somewhere along the lines in those experiences a belief 
that at some point God wouldn't quite come through and I'd have to fend for myself. And I realized that my, my trust in him was fractured because my expectation of him was to operate in a certain way. And when my expectation was not fulfilled, my trust in him got fractured. And so I had to bring that to him and say, you know what, Lord, I realized that I'm not trusting you because I started to believe back here that you weren't trustworthy. And so I had to repent of that. God, forgive me for not trusting you. Thank you that you did show up and you did bring reprieve to those relationships and you did provide an out to that relationship. You ended that one and you brought grace to this one and and you did show up and you did show faithful. So Lord, I just I submit that wrong belief to you and I ask that you'd that you would heal my heart from that wound and that you would show me every time I'm confronted, every time my ability to trust you is confronted, remind me of your faithfulness. And so I had to go through that process of seeing where my trust had gotten fractured so that I could submit that to him as well. So the solution at the end of this, what I've done with my life is realizing that when my when I get into complaining, which is a me focus and it feels like I'm posturing myself like a victim, then I have to stop myself and immediately repent. God, forgive me for complaining. And I shift my perspective to see it through the lens of, you know what? This is uncomfortable, but you're forging something in me. And I want to know what you're growing in me so I can cooperate with what you're doing. Um, if a situation is toxic and I need to actually um, speak up appropriately, so like that boss that I felt like handled me wrong, um, I have the opportunity to sit down with her and, and just talk through what it felt like from my perspective. I've been through situations where I have not had that opportunity, and I've had to release it to the Lord and obtain peace even without closure, and that could be hard, but I feel like when I shift my focus to the Lord and and trust Him with those situations, it gives me the grace to let go of them and to move forward. I don't want to be hung up with my past. I don't want my past hanging on me like a bunch of baggage. I want to move forward. God is bigger than those things. God is bigger than your limitations. God is bigger than those challenging situations. He's bigger than those coworkers who make you work harder than they do. He's bigger than than the doors that have not opened to you yet. If doors have not opened to you yet and you're still waiting for your next season, I would challenge you to stop and ask the Lord, God, where have I been maybe complaining? Where have I, because of my complaining, not been trusting you in my life? And then just spend a couple minutes, just repent. Anything that comes to mind that you should repent of, and repent just means saying, God, I'm sorry. I realized that was wrong. I don't want to do it that way. Help me to do it right. That's repentance. Leaving it before him, just saying you're sorry and asking him to cleanse you. The word says in uh, 1 John 1, 9, I believe that it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He cleanses us from that. So that it's so cleansing to be repentant. I personally love repenting because it's very, very cleansing. It feels like it just sets me back right. It resets my inner self. So Shift from pride. Pride is me focused. Pride is victimized, but that is not who you are. Humility says, I'll consider others better than myself and I will look at my life through the lens of trusting God. I can trust God. He's got my back. He's got my future. He's got my promotions. He's got my open doors and I'm going to trust him and I'm going to thank him. A great antidote for complaining is gratitude. When I start complaining, I stop myself and I say, you know what? I'm going to focus on what God has done. I'm going to look for what God has done. I'm going to stay focused on what God has done because when I do that, it A, encourages my heart, but B, allows him to continue to move in my life in that way because it keeps me from getting into complaining and grumbling. So I hope this was helpful, guys. Sorry, that was loud. I hope this was helpful. This was kind of a game changer for me. I hope it can serve to be like a game changer for you as well if if these are some things that you're dealing with. Um, this was a longer episode. I thought it was going to be shorter, but I've talked for an hour, so bless your heart for still listening. All right, stay tuned because I'm going to get into life hacks. Three fashion tips for fall. We'll make it quick. Love you guys. Bye. <laughs>
All right, fall is here, and so is some of the most fabulous fashion styles in the whole year. I, it's just my favorite. So real fast, here's three things I want to throw at you that will ramp your fall style. Firstly, wide leg pants are in. They're officially in as of 2020. The last decade was all about the skinny jeans, and this decade is more about the wide oversized silhouette. So <clears throat> with wide leg pants, a couple things you can do to make them look fabulous on you is if you're going to wear a lot of volume on the bottom, keep it more fitted on top. Not tight necessarily, but, you know, tuck the shirt with your wide leg pants or do a little knot or a half tuck or something to give it a little bit more definition because that will balance your look and it'll allow the wide leg pants to really be the center of attention of your outfit. Also with wide leg pants, something that will make them make your legs look really long is if, especially if they're long ones, wear a pointed toe shoe. Um, with wide leg pants, I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can break all the rules, like fashion rules are made for breaking. But if you want it to look really visually appealing, <clears throat> a long leg looks fabulous with, with wide leg pants because, of course, they add width. So it already creates volume on the bottom. So keeping that long look just really flatters it. And so a pointed toe shoe, whether it's a heel or a flat, doesn't really matter, does wonders. The next step in would be an open toe shoe. Um, it's a little bit less elong elongating, but can still really capture it, especially if your pants are like the right length and, and a fair bit of your foot is showing. Um, and then of course, wearing a wide leg pant pant with a rounded toe is going to be the least elongating. Um, but if you're wearing sneakers with like wide leg crop pants, that's super cute. So if your pants are cropped, of course, there's a lot more flexibility. If you're wearing long wide leg pants, then a pointed toe is going to be your best friend. Okay. With hats, fall is great for hats. But when I style people, most people, probably 98% of people I talk to, they're like, oh, I love hats. I love how they look, but I just don't feel like I can pull it off. Literally, almost everybody says this. So what I, I used to feel the same way. So what I did is I started to pay attention to how to position my hat on my head that might make it more flattering. I find that with certain, and with different hats, it's different, of course, because the style creates a different look. And so with a wide brimmed, a Panama hat is like your best starting point. It's the most versatile, looks great on everybody. Um, it'll go great with lots of different kinds of outfits. It's just like, if you're going to buy one hat, buy a Panama hat. Okay. And it's basically the one with like, it's got a little bit of a dip on top and a little bit of a, a point in the top section, but then it has a real stiff rim that goes pretty wide. Um, and so that's a Panama hat and try playing with it, maybe tilt it back and just set it back on the crown of your head, um, angled up almost like, so when you look straight at your face, it's almost like you've got a big halo around your head, um, you know, from the front. Or if you tip it down and put it just above your eyebrows, like maybe half halfway up your forehead, that it can give you a little bit more of a Carmen San Diego look, a little bit more sultry, um, depending on what you're wearing, could give you a little bit more of a safari <laughs> look. So it depends on if you're after that. But it is a great, that's a great way to protect your face from the sun if you're going to be outside, is setting it lower on your head. Um, Anyway, so play with the positioning. Just see what works with your face. And, of course, a Panama hat is going to be your best starting point if you want to dip into the world of hats for style. And go on Pinterest and search um, fall outfits with hat. And it'll give you lots of ideas of ways you can throw on a hat. Honestly, ripped jeans, a little basic t-shirt with a really cute necklace and some cute shoes. Throw on a hat and you're good. A sundress, denim jacket, and a hat you're good. Like you can, you can do a lot with a hat. Um, leather jacket. Mm, yes, please. Okay. So the third thing that I love for fall, <clears throat> try swapping out your plain black leggings for leather leggings. <laughs> Any of you who know me are giggling right now because you know how I love leather leggings. I like leather leggings because for two reasons, well, three, actually all the reasons. Uh, a, leather leggings can be very slimming because they 
fit a little more snugly and they can hold you in real great, especially Spanx. Um, if you are getting Spanx or a really fitted kind, I would go up a size. I went up two sizes for my Spanx because I don't want to feel like a sausage in my leggings. Um, but with leather leggings, I also love them because when you're wearing a longer top, it allows your top to slide on it and not get stuck on it and get bunchy in weird places. And so I don't like my clothes to stick to each other. I like them to cooperate with each other and leather leggings do that wonderfully. And then also when you got to wear leggings with like a long top or, um, you know, when it gets cold outside and you want to do boots and the leggings and the dress kind of thing, leather leggings just kind of kick it up a notch. They just add that little zhuzh to your look that elevates it a bit and kind of gives it a sophistication that regular cotton leggings are not going to give you. So save the cotton leggings for when you're like lounging around the house. Wear your leather leggings when you want to get out and look a little sassy. They're great with heels. I like leather leggings personally because they show all my curves and they're a little eye grabbing. I like to wear longer tops with them. Um, if I get leather pants that are maybe not quite the same as leggings, I would try it with maybe a tuck top or something a little shorter. Um, but in general, my modesty comfort zone is to have my butt and my thighs and my front parts all covered with a shirt because I just feel like that is a little classier on me because of how curvy I am. <laughs> so anyways, go out there. I will say you can find leather leggings and the Panama hat. I have saved, I've bought both of those. I haven't bought the leggings from Amazon, but I bought the hat. I bought two hats from Amazon. Um, so search Amazon for Panama hat. I think I spent less than 20 bucks for mine, and they're great. The leather leggings you can also find on Amazon. I think I've seen those for under 20 bucks as well. Um, just look for ones that are nice and stretchy. Make sure that they've got spandex in their list of fabric ingredients. Um, and with wide leg pants, play with the wide leg pants. Look up, if you're not sure how to do it, Look up on Pinterest outfits with wide leg pants or whatever, wide leg pant outfits, and get some ideas of what you like and just try to copy one of the looks. And pay attention also, I will say this, most wide leg pants are going to are gonna be a high rise. They come up around the waist. If you're like me and you have a short torso, it's going to be a little harder for it to look great because coming up higher on the waist only shrinks your torso and so it makes you look even shorter on top. So what I do is I'll frequently just tuck the shirt right into the front so you can see the top of the pants, but then I'll let the shirt kind of drape down on the sides so it still gives the illusion of a longer torso. Um, so just pay attention to that. But yeah, I hope those tips help you this fall as you're deciding what to wear to look fabulous out there. And stay tuned. Maybe I'll throw some more tips up there in these life hacks section, but otherwise you can come follow me at J Samuel Styling on Instagram. Other, and other than that, follow my podcast if you aren't already on Instagram at Java with Jen. I, I put out like surveys and I talk to you guys and I read your comments and I get your DMs and I love to interact with you guys on Instagram. So make sure you're following me over there because I just love staying connected with y'all that way. So love you guys. Thanks for listening. Feel free to share this episode if it spoke to you and meant something to you and I will catch you next week. Love y'all. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. For those of you who've rated or shared this podcast on social media, thank you. Reading your comments and reviews always means so much to me. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say hey. It's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon, or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. Thank you to each of you for your ongoing support. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. Until next time, remember, you've got this and God's got you.